connection is, is so immense between the two things, you'd almost have to say that the analogy limps in principle. Uh, it seems to me that the, the basis for these arguments, all this fairly recent stuff in the last you know, couple of decades, what you're articulating, but yeah. uh, the basis for them been around for a while. It's just they got to just. Sure. But there's something else that's come up as chaos theory, and I'm thinking of May's mm -hmm. results. It basically says that all, the, all those equations that we thought were nice and linear sure. actually all inherently have nonlinear aspects, sure. which sort of screws up the whole. Uh, model that we're coming from to begin with. I kind of think it supports where you're going, but I'm just wondering if you've reflected sure. on... Uh, sure have, yeah. Actually, uh, t to be honest with you, it, it is rather interesting that if you can kind of have indeterminate occurrences uh, coming into a determinate uh, space-time coordinate and law-like system, right, and they do it in such a fashion that they're not, they're not going to affect the order of emergence coming from life, right? This, it's like a wild card, which I didn't include in the article, right? And you take the wild card and you just say, I'm going to put a wild card into the formula. And this wild card is, let's suppose it's indeterminate, right? We're not talking about uncertainty here. We're talking about indeterminacy, which is kind of like a, uh, the conventional interpretation of quantum theory, right? And you just say, it's real indeterminacy here. A and let's suppose for just a moment that the real indeterminacy functioned like a wild card. But, get this, the real indeterminacy never had enough significance to throw off the complexification of the universe. In other words, the complex leading to the complex leading to the higher complex leading to the higher complex leading to the higher viewpoint. But it was a wild card that always operated within the con confines of the laws that would be required to give rise to this higher order complexes. Do you know the odds of that? I'll give you a wild card, but it'll never be significant enough to interrupt all the complexes required for a life form to develop. I'd say, remember, chaos is not chaos. Quantum indeterminacy certainly has parameters it is not a pure indeterminacy by any means. And of course, thank goodness, the parameters right, of quantum indeterminacy cannot affect complexification within our universe, allowing an intelligent life form thereby to develop. And thank goodness that nonlinear mathematics is not really a chaos. It's just an alternative form of establishing parameter through non-scaled or non-metric areas. Right? Thank goodness all those wonderful parameters, once again, are exactly what they are so that the nonlinear and the indeterminate will not interrupt, but may singularly enhance the process of complexification within the universe. Another reason to suspect, as again, the interrelationship of the constants and equations narrows the window of acceptable values of the constants to give rise to an anthropic universe, that somebody, it's almost irresistible, something rather nicely d designed them. You stumble over. Now we've got nonlinear correlations. It's amazing. I mean, just the narrow, the window just narrows. So I, I think, uh, as you suspected at the end of your question, there's no doubt about it. Indeterminacy and its non-effect on complexification is just, or non-linear functions being involved in, and its non-effect in complexification shows even just how well thought out the whole thing is. Even the nonlinear does not disrupt the highly improbable path toward complexification. Not just in our universe, but in any possible universe. Most interesting. Anyway, it was a long answer. Excuse me. Um, Bobby Smith, you were very rhetorically generous in, in laying out the choices as three, um, three choices involving faith. Mm -hmm. But in the way you make the argument, uh, your, the clear implication is that one of the statements, or one of the positions of faith is more reasonable than the yeah. others. And uh, 
uh, that I think is consistent with the kind of thing I was trying to develop, suggesting we don't get absolute knockdown drag out proofs. Mm -hmm. We do have reasons for preferring theistic hypotheses sure. over non theistic ones. And what struck me was your discussion, for example, of the various chance possibilities. Yeah. We wouldn't accept in our ordinary form of reasoning chance as an explanation for anything that had the, the character that you described as being yeah. extremely improbable and yet also doing something functionally. Yeah. When we encounter systems like that in our ordinary experience, sure. and they are highly improbable, we infer design as part of our ordinary we do. Stru structure of reasoning. And similarly, we never use this backward causation that the strong anthropic principle. And it's an ontological contradiction, quite frankly. And in fact, it's, it's pitiably unreasonable. But I was trying to be fair. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, so, yeah I, I just was wanting to point out that in a sense, you're using the same structure of argument that I was expounding in the cosmological case. Of yeah. You're inferring to a best explanation Yes, there's faith because we don't have absolute proof. Sure. But some faiths are more reasonable than others. Oh, according yes. According to our ordinary standards of reasoning that we employ every day, such that the naturalists are guilty of a kind of special pleading. To yeah. I mean, I'll just repeat what Steve said. I mean, that's obviously <laughs> what I am saying between the lines. I mean, you know, obviously I am not advocating that a virtual infinity to one possibility is either reasonable or responsible. To be very honest with you, Steve is correct in any other scientific modality. When we approach infinity in probability functions, we always infer law or design rather than a preference for an infinity to one. We always, always infer it. This is the only instance that I know of up to this point where in general many scientists have preferred to believe in a virtual infinity to one rather than infer law-like, design-like, information-like bias loading of the dice into the equation. I don't know of any other. And therefore, I do think a supernatural designer argument is more reasonable and responsible. But because I put the word supernatural in front of the word designer, and it's not just law-like in the sense of natural law, natural design, I want to be very cautious, right, because we're moving out of the realm of science and I am now moving into the realm of metaphysics, right? The minute I use that word supernatural, I just left the realm of physics and went into the realm of metaphysics. Once that occurs, of course, what I have to do is at least acknowledge that I didn't make the inference directly from physics because I can't see the other side of what happened there, but boy, if you're asking me, do I think my belief is reasonable and responsible? Yes. Do I think it is strongly founded? Yes. If the alternatives are virtual infinity to one from which I generally infer some kind of law-like uh, behavior, and if it has to be a supernatural law-like behavior, then I infer a supernatural law-like behavior from a metaphysical perspective. I think what Steve said about the anthropic, strong anthropic principle is very clear. I mean, I think it is so dubious. I mean, anyone who really, I mean, Really, I mean, it, it is just fraught with contradictions and paradoxes and cannot be treated seriously. But I, I have some friends who do, and so I, I, I'm just trying to be fair. So, but it just, it just really, I it just can't see it. And, and n nobody would do this if it weren't for trying to wriggle out of a, of a supernatural design. Additional questions, I think. Dr. Good. Goggins? Father, it seems that um, even if this universe did not have any life, forms in some sense it would still be a very complex universe yes so for example we could just point to the the exact way that matter is distributed in this universe yes down to the subatomic particles right well, what are the chances that that you would have exactly this distribution of matter well that's uh, that's uh, the chances of that are infinitesimally small sure but presumably we couldn't in that case reason to uh, an intelligent designer in that case no. And, also, and it seems that in, in any universe with, with, with any degree of richness at all, you're going to have some sort of imaginable, unimaginable complexity yeah. just in the, uh, the arrangement of the matter in that universe. Yeah. Uh, but presumably not in those cases can, can we infer an intelligent designer. So how is it that just on the basis of the complexity of the universe, we can conclude that there was an intelligent designer? In a sentence, it's complexification toward higher order activity. This is really key. 
because that's always been at the heart of, the tele of any kind of teleological argument. We're not dealing with any form of complexity. We're dealing with complexities or complexifications, if you're going to make it in, into a, a schema, an evolving generating schema, be a complexification, toward higher order activities. In other words, I frank, uh, go back to what I was saying about the goo, if you can re just recall for just a second. Right? You can say, yeah, I got a really great complex here. And it's purple goo instead of red goo. But it's still fundamentally goo. I got a really interesting distribution of matter here. A and it's really, it's much better than globular clusters. It's, it's much better. This one's even more evenly distributed. The trouble is, it's still kind of mass energy. It doesn't yet quite have the higher order activities that we see in a life form or in an intelligent life form, which require not only complexes, not only interesting distributions, but complexes of complexes leading to higher order activities. Let me just give an example. You could say in a computer, right, you could say, oh, I can give, let's do some random uh, generation of some uh, regular binary switches and, and, you know, in other words, assembly language, right? I'm just going to shoot these things through and see if I can come up with some neat designs, right, in, in my binary switching patterns, you know, by, by putting a little current, you know, uh, through, through the computer. Now, you might come up with some really interesting ones, and you go, oh, that one's beautiful. Hey, that's a nifty design. That almost has a fractal component, right? But all of a sudden, what if you got a compiler language like Fortran? I mean, and it did the do loops, the if statement, and then all of a sudden, the next time through, you got C and then E. You know, and I mean, complex computer languages. And not only did the complex computer language emerge once, it was consistent and repeatable. From now on in, I type things randomly on the computer, like do, and it does a do loop. And you go, and there's no compiler in here at all, right? I mean, you'd say, wait a minute. You need a compiler to make Fortran out of what's called uh, assembly language, basic language, right? Or not basic, that basic in the normal language. But uh, out of the most fundamental kind of language, right? <laughs> Actually, basic is a compiler language, it is suggested. But anyway, the long and short of it is, though, is if you did that, if you believed that all the results of a Fortran compiler came out without any compiler present at all from mere assembly switch, and you had a higher order activity emerging from merely lower order switches without anything, you know, anything to kind of explain it, then I'd say, gosh, I, I do have a bridge to sell you. Because it's not a pretty design. It's a higher order activity, and that's what's key to teleology. Does that answer the question more or less?